The most important thing for a patient to realize is the patient who has the best outcome is the patient who's most engaged in their care. So you uh, really, as the patient, direct your care. And while the health providers will tell you what to do or how to do it, you need to be comfortable with that decision. Because if you're uncomfortable with that decision, then it makes it harder for you to recover. So asking questions that'll, re that'll make you more comfortable, no matter what they are, is relevant to your care. Board certification is really, uh, it's a marker that uh, that surgeon has met a number of very stringent requirements. They are recognized by the, uh, the institution as well as the national organizing body for that specialty as having uh, met all the, the important standards for practice, competency, and um, background. So they may have to submit their previous case logs, they've looked at their outcomes, and more recently as part of the national effort to improve healthcare, a lot of the boards now are requiring regular recertification, some on an every three to four year basis, so that you have to maintain your skills and show increased growth in your knowledge about the specialty. So it really is a marker of someone who is committed to high quality care and who is someone who is trying to stay abreast of the, um, the knowledge and the, the changes in healthcare and their specialty. That, that is, has become, an, uh, unfortunately, an, an issue in specific areas of surgery, um, namely uh, more of the cosmetic surgeries uh, and some of the other procedures where a person with an MD has been uh, taken some courses, t uh, weekend courses here or there, and now is performing procedures that are not prescribed to being only done by certain providers. It's, it's less common in abdominal surgery or chest surgery because the risks are too high. Those have to be done in inpatient settings. And so the hospitals won't allow you to do it unless you have qualifications. However, in the outpatient setting and the office setting for some minor surgical procedures, there are a number of cases uh, where providers who are wanting to expand their practice have started doing procedures which they weren't necessarily uh, or appropriately trained to do. If you can lose the weight in a healthy manner, you're going to uh, do better after surgery. It's clearly been shown that patients who can get up easier, move around easier, um, are going to do better after surgery. It also is a function of weight is not necessarily a marker of good nutrition. And a lot of patients who are overweight are actually malnourished in certain important uh, um, manners uh, in regards to protein levels and vitamin levels. And if you can uh, lose weight in a healthy manner and increase your protein level uh, as far as your lean body mass, you'll actually do better uh, in the post-op period. Prehabilitation is what some people call this, is that just like an athlete, you're going to perform better if you're in better shape and your strength is, is, is better. Surgery is um, a major event, a physiologic injury, and you have to be able to respond to that. When you are stronger, you have increased lean body mass, your body will be able to withstand a period of stress and will stand a period of not being able to eat better uh, if it has higher protein levels. Uh, higher protein level is a basically a function of increased muscle mass. So in a number of interesting interventions, even in patients who are wheelchair bound, if you can give them a period of time where they improve their nutritional status, at the same time improve their body strength, either by arm exercises, hand grip, those patients do statistically better with their surgical outcomes compared to comparable patients who don't undergo the prehabilitation. Unfortunately, smoking has um, significant negative impacts on almost all surgical procedures we've looked at. Um, the reason why is because it, it impacts the small blood vessels. 
the nicotine and many of the compounds in tobacco smoke constrict the blood vessels. You need those blood vessels to be open to bring blood down to the level of the healing wound. What we've seen is smokers have increased risk of infections, have an increased risk of uh, pneumonias, and uh, poor uh, outcomes as it relates to cardiovascular events. So even stopping smoking for two weeks to three weeks before your surgery has been shown to be beneficial as far as your outcomes. What it means is you have difficulty breathing uh, and you have intermittent um, obstruction of your airway. Now, usually what happens is your body will wake you up, even though you may not remember waking up, and allow you to breathe. The reason why sleep apnea or undiagnosed sleep apnea in the post-op period is a, risk, is a risky proposition is because right after you've had an anesthetic, a lot of the mechanisms that would normally allow you to wake up yourself uh, are inhibited. And then you add on to that possibly narcotics, which also reduce your ability to take a deep breath or even your drive to breathe. And then you sort of add on to it like surgical discomfort, which also may make you want to not breathe as much. So all those things mean you're at higher risk from difficulty breathing in the post-op period and does pose a risk to you in the immediate period of after, during your recovery. A lot of institutions now, including Mayo Clinic, are concerned about, are so concerned about sleep apnea, is that we actually screen for it in the post-op period in the recovery room. And in certain patients, if they are at high risk for undiagnosed sleep apnea, we have protocols in place here to either uh, admit them overnight into an obser observation status in a more intense uh, care area, such as uh, a monitored care setting, or we'll actually have them evaluated in hospital for sleep apnea and intervene earlier. So it's really becoming an issue now where patients who uh, have sleep apnea need to come forward and tell their providers if they're having surgery because it may not come up uh, in the routine discussion. There are a number of, of things that the patient and the care team can do to accelerate your recovery from surgery. The most important thing from the patient's point of view is come into the surgery as optimized as you can. So that means, if possible, having lost weight or increased your lean um, muscle mass. It means getting better control of your diabetes, knowing that you're on a stable regimen with good sugar uh, uh, levels. It means, if possible, decreasing or stopping smoking altogether. That's what the, the patient can do. The t care team working with the patient can do a number of things to accelerate your recovery. If you can and your surgeon feels comfortable with it, doing a minimally invasive approach has been shown to decrease length of stay, decrease pain, decrease risk of infection. Early feeling, feeding is interesting, especially as a, a colorectal surgeon. When I was training, no one got any food for the first two to three days. Uh, sometimes not for uh, the first week. Now, the night of surgery after we do your colectomy, you'll be getting food. And the reason why is because that's what your body normally does. And accelerated recovery pathways try to get your body back to the normal state as soon as possible. That has been shown to reduce your body's stress response. And so early feeding, um, the night of surgery, has been shown not to increase your risk of complications and has been shown to decrease the time in hospital and reduce complications. Early ambulation is the same thing. It used to be no one would get up for the first day, first 24 hours. Now again, the night of surgery, up walking around with the assistance of the nurse. The reason we can do this is because of a lot of the other interventions that we do in these pathways. We avoid systemic narcotics. We don't use as many catheters. Our patients no longer have tubes in their nose after surgery, which was something that would keep them in bed. So there's things that we've changed over time that we had done because tradition told us to do it, but there was no good evidence that it really made a difference.